I'm so grateful to be here and looking forward to this conversation. I'd love to introduce you all, you all, you all to Jivana. Did I say that correctly? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Jivana Heyman is the founder and director of Accessible Yoga, an organization dedicated to increasing access to the yoga teachings and supporting yoga teachers. Mm. He's the author of many books that we will probably mention. And his books, classes, and trainings offer support to yoga teachers and yoga therapists in finding ways to bring creativity and collaboration into their teaching while respecting the ancient yoga tradition. Mm. Welcome. I'm so happy uh, to have you here. Thank you so much, Shelby. It's great to be here with you. And thanks for that introduction. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to add um, from your bio or where you are in the world, how you're doing today? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll say hi. I'm Jivana, my pronouns, he and him, joining from Santa Barbara, California, which is Chumash land. And um, I'm doing okay, you know, a lot going on in the world. It's kind of a difficult time. It's hard to watch the news and to be human at this moment when, you know, there's always a lot of suffering, but somehow we're more connected right now, which is an interesting experience for me. But um, I, I feel good. I feel lucky that I get to talk to you and share about the thing I love, which is teaching yoga. So <laughs> I'm excited excited to be here with you i am too i wonder if you'd be up for sharing what inspired you or inspires you to be doing the work that you're doing mm. well i mean the kind of long story i can just go back a bit i mean i i was lucky because my my grandmother taught me yoga when i was a kid you know she was um kind of an unusual person and had really was really interested in spirituality and she lived in LA in the fifties and sixties and studied with a bunch of people. And, and like my, literally my earliest memories are like her practicing every morning when we were, when she would live with us for a lot of the time. And um, it was so amazing. Like here she is standing on her head, you know, what is she doing? <laughs> and um, you know, she also had a big family. I have five kids in my family. So I got to have a special time with her then I would go and like be with her during practice and she would teach me. And so that was really amazing. And then um, I'm a gay man and I, I came out in the eighties, you know, uh, like I think 1984 was when I came out and I was right in the middle of the AIDS epidemic and my community was really devastated. Um, you're probably younger than me. <laughs> maybe maybe, you maybe don't a remember. little. <laughs> you don't I'm an 80, 81 baby. <laughs> oh yeah, you're a lot younger than me. Uh, I'm 56 and um, yeah, like the AIDS crisis, but you're old enough to remember those days, I bet. I mean, it was yeah. just really unbelievable. And and it was really focused on gay men at that time in the beginning. And I was living near New York and then in New York. And then I moved to San Francisco. It was just like the hub of all of that going on. And, and so many of my friends got sick and died, including my best friend. Uh, my best friend, Kurt, died of AIDS in 1995. And um, I, got in, I became an AIDS activist and just, I didn't know what else to do. Like I was just you know, grieving and processing that was quite challenging and a lot of anger. And so being able to express that through, you know, demonstrating and getting arrested and all that was really productive, I think, at the time for me just to kind of get it out. But then it was not at one point. It became a little, um, it was like, yeah, it, at some point I realized I wasn't able to keep going and mm -hmm. and then I I started I, I reached out to help and I realized for help and I realized I could go back to yoga and so I found a yoga teacher um back then who took me under her wing and her name was Kazuko and she really helped me um kind of relearn how to care for myself and it, you know also 20s in your 20s like it's a challenging time to so just kind of figure out how to be in the world you know and like how to care for yourself and so it was just it was it was a moment for me where yoga, I, I feel like I was exposed to yoga again and it basically saved me um, again mm -hmm. and gave me like the tools I needed to keep going. And so then I was just really uh, wanting to 
talk to everyone about yoga and share, you know, and, and especially my community. So I, be, I, I became a yoga teacher specifically to share yoga with people with HIV and AIDS, actually. Wow. I love how you frame yoga as a way to care for yourself. Yeah. So often it's to get fit or yeah. I don't know. I feel like it's just such a loving sounding way, just as a way to care for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely is for me. I think I would even say what yoga for me is it's a spiritual practice. And I think if we look traditionally, it is. And I think spiritual practice is a way to care for ourselves. And, you know, it's interesting to me the way that mm, spiritual practice, especially Eastern spiritual practices like yoga are sometimes, yeah, like, I don't know. Well, culturally appropriated which is something i think maybe we will talk about later but just like how parts of it are taken out and used and rather than kind of trying to comprehend the fullness because it's huge like yoga is a huge tradition that it's a complicated tradition too there's so much there and and it's almost like um they're they're sometimes contradictory themes and teachings and schools and threads so it can be confusing and so sometimes it gets like watered down because of that, I think. But in its fullness, I think yoga offers self-care in the real sense of the word, <clears throat> you know, like connecting with myself. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I'm curious if there was a bridge between that original intention and population to now. I know, I think now you focus mostly on accessible yoga. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. My, uh, my students with HIV and AIDS taught me that yoga needs to be accessible. I mean, they showed me like, I, I was trained in a particular tradition. And then they showed me like, oh, well, that needs to be adapted for me, you know, especially when they were getting sick or dying. Like I would, I would have students that were literally who died. And uh -huh. <clears throat> they showed me that yoga offered you know, support for them even through that process. And so that's kind of what I was getting at before. There's just like this, there, there's so much to yoga in terms of the, I think the more subtle uh, teachings around, um, I, I would say it, it's not, we could use the word spirituality, but I actually think it's about having a relationship with ourselves. And so I think what I saw yoga doing is offering like tools, techniques and teachings that could help people reconnect when they felt lost or disconnected. And I, and I feel like that my students, like I said, my students showed me actually, they, they, they were teaching me. And so, um, and, and they still do, but definitely accessible yoga grew out of that experience of teaching people who were um, disabled and, um, or chronically ill or, or dying. And, and they showed me how deep, we could go like it was pretty incredible you know mm. yeah I love that I'm I'm wondering if you could define or describe what you mean by accessible yoga mm. yeah that's a good question um I think most people think of accessible yoga as adapting yoga you know, which is a lot of what I do. Like I teach adapted practices, especially asana, you know, the physical postures. People think of accessible yoga as maybe like chair yoga or bed yoga. And that's great. Like, I love that stuff. And I, and I share a lot, like on social media, I share a lot of those practices and, and it's fun. And I think it gets people's attention and it's a way in. It's a great kind of yeah, accessible <laughs> practice to do physical, the physical part. But I, to me, accessible yoga has more to do with like, accessing the fullness of the practice yeah yeah and having that available to everyone in all bodies exactly because mm -hmm. again if it's a spiritual practice which it, it it's universal like these are universal teachings that say that we we all share the same spirit this essence and what i love about yoga is that it's so positive in that regard it's like the yoga teachings say that we that's who we are we are spirit it's not like we have to get it or you know do something it's more about uh, removing obstacles to that experience and i just love that very positive approach you know that we're just kind of clearing away um what, what's in the way of our experience of our true nature and that's really the core question of yoga 
Um, and so to me, accessible yoga is just like a way of perceiving that and trying to connect with the universality of the teachings and, and, and remind myself and every and my students that it's for everyone. And, and actually for teachers too. And I do a lot of work with yoga teachers, like as you mentioned in my bio, and I think sometimes yoga teachers need support in seeing that, you know, or even like more than seeing it, but actually like applying it because it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard to teach to a real diverse group of people. And, you know, we're, we're taught specific skills as yoga teachers and tools. And sometimes you really have to challenge yourself as a teacher and, and learn new skills or new creative ways of, of sharing yoga in order to make it work for all your students. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be embodied in order to be sharing. That's true. Yeah. And I think there has to be a, um, hmm, like an opening, like an openness as a yoga teacher to like, to what is, what are my students needing right now? What are they coming to me with in this moment, rather than having this pre-existing idea of this is what I'm sharing, you know, like, I mean, that's okay. You can like, create a class and record it and share it online but that's different than being in pre in someone's presence and then like being able to be to have a relationship with them right and like respond to them in that moment um seeing what works for them or doesn't work or you know just getting an intuitive sense too like oh wow i think maybe i'll share this today i don't you know what i mean like mm -hmm. yeah being connected, being connected. <laughs> that's yeah. it I, I so appreciate the frame because I, you know, I just struggled myself with chronic illness for about two decades. Mm. And I even trained as a yoga teacher mm. and I couldn't go to classes. I felt alone. I felt like I mm. didn't belong. I felt annoyed when cues were being given that I couldn't possibly pull off. I felt like I had to perform in order to impress my teacher, or get their attention. Mm. Mm. And I just couldn't go to yoga anymore because I only felt angry when I was in there, um, which is a whole nother layer. I wish teachers knew how to kind of welcome anger <laughs> uh -huh. and help me really connect with what was going on in that deeper level. And yeah. I didn't have those teachers back then. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, that's, I, thanks for saying that. I think that's really useful. I mean, I, I love that part about anger. I mean, I think, I think it's as a yoga teacher, really our job is to just create a container for the students to have an experience and to stop being attached to what that is. And so there would be room for anger if that's what appears, you know, it's like, I don't, it, I have like, I have a new book, which I think we, we're going to talk about a little bit, you know, the teacher's guide to accessible yoga, which is really a, about this. Like, how can you as a yoga teacher build that space like create and hold that space and i think a lot of it is to reflect on who you are and do the work yourself which is challenging and understand what your needs are but not not to to have boundaries and to not really need your students to fill your gap to fill your void but to find other ways and to really be present with them in a way like that you can just allow them to be right mm -hmm. to be themselves whatever occurs yeah. I wonder if you'd be up for sharing a bit about how you create a container. Yeah. I'm I'm aware that a lot of the folks that listen to this podcast are healing practitioners in various mod modalities. And we're yeah. always talking about how do we create a container? How do we support folks to feel more safe in our presence and in our practices? And so I'd love to hear your view on that. Yeah, for sure. I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, I, I think, well, kind of a whole book, to be honest, but <laughs> uh, let's see, some points are self-reflection to spend time not only practicing yourself, whatever you need to do to be centered and to find, to fill yourself up as best you can when you're coming to hold space for others, and also to reflect on your identity and your position in the world your positionality and to, to really be honest with yourself about that like how what in what ways do I hold power 
because I think a lot of the issues that come up are actually these issues of like social identity. And um, so for me, like I'm a queer, white, cisgender man. And so I was like, I have like a lot of people won't feel comfortable in my presence just because I'm a man. Like that's just not going to work for everyone. So I just need to acknowledge that for myself. Like I just know that. And the more I can be honest with myself about that and who I am and what am I bringing in or as a white person, like what am I bringing into this space? Um, I think that helps and it's not going to solve the problem, but that helps a lot. And then kind of going back to what I said before about getting my needs met somewhere else. So I think that's important is that when I'm in relationship with my students, it is a relationship, but it's not that I need anything from them. Like hopefully they're paying me, right? That's what they're <laughs> doing. They're giving me that so that I don't need anything else. I don't need them to like me. I don't need them to tell me it was a great class. I don't need them to say anything to me, right? I can just be there and support them in that time. And I think that that changes things to, to be reflective about my needs more, I think can help. And then there's stuff around trauma-informed teaching that I think is more just like specific things you mm -hmm. can do when we're teaching, like understanding agency, your students' innate agency and the fact that they get to decide what to do with their bodies and you don't get to decide. And that when you're offering instruction, it's suggestions and whether someone does it or not is okay right and and to try to be careful that you're not creating a competitive environment right where people have to and also often it's trauma related where they feel like they need to perform yeah you know, for the teacher i think like you mentioned earlier i think this happens a lot mm -hmm. where we create spaces where people feel like they have to conform they have to look like the teacher they have to dress like the teacher and they have to do like what the teacher is doing or what the other students are doing. And it's almost like this weird, like kind of performance, like it's almost like a dance performance. <laughs> you know, that's not really necessary in yoga. That doesn't create a safer space. Always having consent from the students to participate. And then especially to do like to touch, I would say, be really, really conscious about touch. Yeah, yeah I would say just to avoid touch as much as possible, um, or at least make sure you always have consent. and. And also I'd say the other thing that I think will surprise people, and I focus on a lot on the book is the inter-student relationships. I don't know what the peer-to-peer -peer relationships that happen in group classes that I just, over the years, I've been teaching almost, well, it'll be 30 years next year. And almost all the conflict and challenges that have come up in class is between students. Mm -hmm. And so, really reflecting on that. Like, how can I support students in like, I don't know what the word is, just like doing this with each other too, like being self-aware so they're not hurting each other. Mm -hmm. And it's challenging. That's the challenging one. You know, I can't control them. And so sometimes there can be stuff happening. Yeah. Especially if it's maybe a drop-in class, a one-time deal. <laughs> it's hard that's, to create that container. That's the hardest. Yeah. yeah. I really preferred ongoing students, you know, and just really like another, a whole different experience, right? When you have yeah. an ongoing relationship with people and get to know them. But then again, other things would come up like when between students over time, someone might like, be interested in someone and start asking them out or you know and that could create tension in the group and for them that could be an issue that you might need to get involved with sometimes I have students that would become like my assistant even though I didn't want them to and they would start like <laughs> assisting other students or sometimes yeah. they argue over like having the right spot in the class or the temperature of the room or windows open I don't know it just that that part became challenging for sure and I think can really hinder that feeling of safety actually is what can happen. So, yeah. you know, being a model, I think of that is important. I think so much of what you describe can absolutely be related to trauma responses to how people are interacting with each other, or trying to control the room or trying to be noticed and having awareness around this and creating an understanding can be just so important. And a lot of what you described was kind of external 
Mm-hmm. And whereas, you know, I, I imagine, and from my own experience, yoga is really about the internal connection. So the more we can create the external safety, the more that allows folks to turn inwards. So would you say that's true? Oh, yeah. And actually regarding that, something that I find important is to, as a teacher, to not um, project onto the students in terms of what their experience will be of the practice. Because sometimes I found, like I've dealt with anxiety in my life. And sometimes if I'm in a yoga class, something will make me anxious. And oftentimes it would be like a new subtle practice, like a new kind of meditation or a new kind of breathing practice. And I would find, I remember, you know, feeling anxious and thinking, well, there's something wrong with me, right? Like I'm not, I'm not good at this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not, or I'm, I can't do yoga or whatever. These like, you know, your my mind would just go to some weird place. And I think as a teacher to be able to give students the freedom to have their experience so, you know, as a teacher, that would mean you could say, well, you can talk about benefits of a practice or something or like why you're doing it, but it in a way that doesn't feel like students need to have that too. Like you could say, oh, the alternate nostril breathing is so calming. And then I know like half of my students are just like struggling to breathe, you know, like feeling short of breath actually, you know, and I'm like, is that calming? I don't know, you know, so like yeah. might be. Like it might be calming and it might not be. I don't know. Right. I love not putting a value judgment and just yeah. having it be an invitation and an experiment. Yeah. yeah. I'm so appreciating this. I have this course of creating safer space and okay. it's for like meditation teachers, um, all sorts of healing practitioners. I don't address yoga that much, but I do have a lot of yoga teachers that end up signing up for it. And I feel like we're speaking the same language. So I'm just really excited. Yeah. You said something in there about students dating each other. And yeah. I got really excited because I have so many yoga teacher friends that think it's totally cool to date their students. And it makes me crazy. Mm-hmm. And I am all about being aware of our power, understanding that, you know, even if someone comes for one class, there's still a power dynamic there. Mm-hmm. We have to be so mindful with these precious souls that come in and, maybe aren't aware of this stuff and have feelings for us. And I just wonder if you might speak on that a little bit. Oh, I love that you brought that up because I mean, it drives me crazy too. Um, I think I have a lot of thoughts about it. One, one is that, you know, yoga offers beautiful ethical teachings, the yamas, which is the first limb of Ashtanga yoga, the eight limbs of yoga from the yoga sutras of Patanjali. And the yamas start with ahimsa, nonviolence. And, you know, I think, <clears throat> that's the commitment we make when we become yoga practitioners and especially yoga teachers is to really try to be of service in the world in a way that doesn't cause harm the best we can the best we can and i just feel like <laughs> so much harm happens in the name of yoga it just kind of makes me frustrated because it, it, it's like because we're human and we mess up and so i get that but i also think there is a the power like you mentioned of being in the position in this, to take the seat of teacher is a position of authority. And I think we have to take that really, really seriously. And I think the first thing we have to do is try our best to practice ethics or or we're not really teaching yoga. And I would say maybe not even teaching spirituality if, if ethics aren't at the very top of what we're thinking about. And even if you're just teaching a little bit, like even if you're not taking that seriously and it's just like one, you teach once a week or whatever, it's still like you have power, like you are in that position, you're taking that seat. And and like you said, I think people, well, I think it's what you're saying that students sometimes identify you with the teachings. They think you're like giving them this experience. Right, they think that the feeling they're having is because of you. Yeah, and I think as a teacher sometimes, I. I we think that too. Like we think, oh wow, I'm so great, you know. And maybe, especially like when I'm insecure. Like I'm, I'm a very shy person naturally, and it took me years to get comfortable as a teacher and do public speaking as a teacher. Like that was just mortifying. But and then I, and then the opposite happened. I had all this positive feedback. The students telling me, "Oh my God, you're amazing! Like this is so incredible!" And it's like I could see how I would go between these extremes in my mind of like I'm terrible or I'm amazing. 
<laughs> yes. It's such a mind game. Mm -hmm. And I think dangerous, actually. And, and I would just go back again to the yoga teachings, which talk about not only ahimsa, but <clears throat> how to work with your ego, you know, and that we want to try to keep the ego in check to connect with our heart, you know, with the spirit. And the ego is an obstacle to that. So, ah. Uh, and you can look at the abuse in yoga. Mm. I mean, my God. So much. So much abuse. And I, and I think in religions in general, actually, I think there's some connection. There's something about spiritual teachings, you know, that holds so much power. And then therefore, because of the power in, that, in those practices, um, people use that unfortunately, um, to have power over each other, you know, yeah. and that's how abuse happens. And I just, I mean, every major yoga lineage has some form of abuse, which is, you know, <clears throat> including my own. So, I mean, I've definitely, you know, I had a teacher who I considered my guru and then found out that he was sleeping with his students. And it just took a while for me to process it. I dedicated like 20 years to, to him and studying with him and learning from him and in the school he created and you know and then it just kind of fell apart in my mind I was like what am I doing yeah the same thing happened with me in my Buddhist lineage mm -hmm. yeah 20 yeah. years <laughs> yeah yeah <sighs> so what do you do <clears throat> that's a so good you started question. teaching about it <laughs> I built a course <laughs> you know, I'm so tired of seeing these dynamics and this was actually the one that I built it around because uh -huh. I have experienced trauma as a student or as a client of practitioners that yeah. took advantage of that power dynamic and I was in my little child trauma state just wanting to be seen as incredible you know and they just missed that because they didn't have the education mm. They didn't have awareness around trauma-informed care and sharing power. And uh, it was just so unfortunate because so much healing could have been available. Yeah. Oh, devastating. I know. Devastating because it's like students are coming and almost like being born into this new version of themselves you know through these practices like literally like exposing the most sensitive parts of themselves and and being so vulnerable and open and and then people take advantage of that and it's just you know really it's really horrible to see and and yet i think the people doing the abuse <clears throat> are also struggling i mean i'm not trying to just make it all black and white i think there are you know I could see how people get lost yeah. you know, as teachers because it's like, you know, like I was trying to say about myself, like so extreme, like I had imposter syndrome. I was shy and I didn't believe in myself. <clears throat> and all of a sudden as a teacher, I was like lifted up on a pedestal. And so I think, you know, it's easy to get caught up in there and that. And so I'm grateful in a way to the struggle that I had <clears throat> with my teacher because that experience showed me that I needed to work on it. Totally. Yeah. And I think it is so important to, uh, you know, be, I mean, gracious in some ways that sometimes it is just a lack of awareness and education. Yeah. Not everybody is out there just malevol malevolently causing abuse. Some people just started dating their student and thought it was fine. And the community supported it because nobody had um, education or awareness. Yeah. So, yeah. I do think there's a lack of awareness. Um, <clears throat> I think relationships with students are the key actually to accessibility is that there's a relationship there and you treat people as equal rather than less than you. And I think if you can see students as your equal and you're equal to them, you know, you're not above or below. I think that's the key. Yes. Yeah. I was talking to David Emerson. Mm -hmm. Do you know David? Mm -hmm. Maybe six years ago. And he was the first person to introduce the concept of sharing power to me. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, oh yeah, we can collaborate. We are equals. Uh, for me, every client that walks in my office, I always just say, you know, I actually trust that you are the wisest person in the room. <laughs> exactly. So. exactly. And I think for yoga teachers, same, that we have to recognize the student's wisdom. Mm -hmm. A lot of students come and they say, what should I do? What should I feel? I don't, you know, tell me, you know, and that's fine. But I think that's our job is to show them, well, actually, you know, yeah, you have the answer, you have the information. Like I have information about yoga, but you know about you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, your experience and what's happening throughout your life and how you're feeling. And I don't have that, mm -hmm. you know, and it takes me back to questions of what is, what is yoga and what does it mean to be quote advanced, you know, in yoga? Because I, I like to change that a little bit because we think of advanced yoga as big poses, you know, doing these big fancy poses. <clears throat> but I think advanced is actually an increased sensitivity to our inner world. Yeah. Right. And interoception, being able to know how you're feeling. And that's a lot. And a lot, a lot of people have that already. Like people don't realize, you know, especially I would say, I find people who have chronic pain or chronic illness, disabled people often have an advanced level of inner awareness. Yeah. just through their lived experience. And so when I, when someone comes to me new and they have any kind of, well, all of us, especially older people have something going on or some trauma, you know, I try to put it back on them. Like, you know, you know, what's best. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. You have a quote on your Instagram page that says, accessibility naturally flows from ethics. And it feels like that's what we're talking about here. Um, I wonder if you might be able to speak more on that and you might want to share about your book too while you're yeah. talking about that. Yeah, I appreciate that you um, saw that one, that quote. I, I love teaching about ethics. I think it's it's such a strange kind of word and field because it feels like I, I think I was trained that ethics were these external guidelines or rules that I had to follow. And that felt kind of, you know, like any other rule, kind of annoying, like, oh, I have to do that. Like, I have to do that. But I just think ethics are different, actually, and especially in spiritual practice, that it's like an internal, um, internal guidance for us, like an internal GPS to keep us on track. It actually... Ethics actually support us and keep us safe and help us deepen our practice. And that's the part I think that's so lost that these, these tools, these are tools in yoga, like maybe the most important ones in yoga. Yeah. And I can't speak for other spiritual traditions, but I would imagine it's similar in a way that ethics offer like the way in, because if you think about it, I mentioned the yamas, you know, the, the, the five main ethical teachings in yoga <clears throat> which are ahimsa, nonviolence, satya, truthfulness, asteya, non-stealing, brahmacharya, which is really about celibacy or controlling your energy, your life force. And then, um, you know, aparigraha, non-hoarding, non-greed, or you could say non-attachment. And each of those, if I really reflect on them, I could think about not how not following that ethical principle causes me harm me it's like i actually am the one who suffers from it and makes my practice harder it's like harder to be with myself it's harder to be in meditation if i'm causing harm if i'm lying i i, I spend all my time thinking about it <laughs> it's like it disturbs my mind so it's just like i think ethics are actually an internal support yeah. in, in this tradition at least i can only speak for yoga that the yoga ethical teachings are um there for us as practitioners and and accessibility flows out of that because to me accessibility is simply about connecting with the depth of the practice and making it available to everyone so it just naturally flows that if you're if, as a teacher or someone who has the power of, in yoga <clears throat> that you can create supportive communities by welcoming people not harming them not stealing from them or stealing their time or their resources or their ideas and um, 
not being greedy about it, you know, just all that. It's like, that's what creates a nice supportive community. Don't you think? I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, absolutely. I, my personal Buddhist Theravada ethics are designed the same way. It's like, whatever disturbs your own mind is the issue, right? And so it's important to have a container, which are those ethics so that we can be at peace, right? Yeah, I mean, that's actually almost the definition of yoga is quieting the mind. And most people don't know that, you know, that <laughs> yeah, they think yoga is the asana stuff. But um, yeah. if you look at the yoga sutras of Patanjali, the second sutra is yoga chitta vritti Narodha, which means, you know, quieting or calming the mind is yoga. Yeah. And then the next one says, then you abide in your own true nature. Then you experience the peace that's you. And the next one even says that at other times when you're not connected with yourself, you have identified with your thoughts. You actually think you are your thoughts, which feels very parallel to Buddhism. And I know that yoga and Buddhism are very connected and intertwined, sharing back and forth between them. So it's not that different really. But, um, but it surprises people that yoga focuses so much on the mind, I think, because they often right. to believe that it's about the body. Yes, it's it's the whole package. It is. That's yeah. why it's so great is you can use the body and work with the body to get to the mind because it's hard to work with the mind. Right. Well, and it's also, uh, I have two things I'm excited to say. <laughs> it's also like when we experience trauma, we tend to leave our bodies a lot or numb or we don't trust what we're feeling and hearing. And so if we're guided into our bodies through yoga and connecting with our mind in that holistic way, there's more of a possibility of really being able to sink into this place that we can call home and know that what we're feeling and hearing mm. is important. And though that's where our truth can live. But when we're not practicing yoga in that kind of way, where we welcome all parts of ourselves and um, all of our ability, all of it, we can really get caught up in the mind and re-perpetuate the trauma cycles. And mm -hmm. so I love that it also offers this avenue to come home in a gentle way when taught in this kind of way. Yeah, exactly. I love that too. I love that connection to trauma. And I do talk about trauma a bit in the book. There's, um, I talk about how Actually, I have a, uh, I interview a teacher, Natita Gesell, who's wonderful. I don't know if you know her. She teaches on mm -hmm. yoga for trauma and um, she has a new book out. Um, I think it's Trauma Conscious. Um, oh no, the book is called Embodied Self-Awareness. Um, mm -hmm. It's really great. But she, she talks about um, one of the things a yoga teacher can do is model a regulated nervous system. And I thought that's really cool. Like I hadn't really just said it that succinctly before, you know, that I think, you know, we care for ourselves. So I think do my practice, but in a way you're also just like being a model of what it's like to be kind of calm and centered and not in a trauma response. And so that can, and that people around that can actually kind of vibe off of you. They can literally like start feeling that themselves when they're in your presence. And I thought that was really beautiful. It so is. I love that. As we're exploring all of these topics, it's not lost on me that we could apply this to so many things. And a lot of the folks that listen to this podcast are coaches. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at word for word, everything from yep. ethics to creating a container to embodiment, all of these things, we could easily apply to that relationship as well. Yeah. Well, it's because it's relationship, you know, and and I think all these, all of this, maybe all the people listening and, and your followers probably <clears throat> are people who hold space for others and help, yeah, and help people to go deep within themselves. And I think that's the challenge is how do you, how do you support that in your students or clients? I mean, that's, that's the question that comes up for me all the time. Sometimes it's very simple. I had, I interviewed, so for each chapter, I interviewed a different teacher who I admire. And some of them were kind of big teachers like um, Keno McGregor. And I don't know if you know, you know, Judith Lassiter, 
Jason Crandall and Jason Crandall kind of cracked me up because he said something about, um, he's like, I don't really know. He's like, accessible yoga is your thing. I don't really know. But he said, I, I know I can be kind. Yeah. And I kind of love that. I was just like, oh yeah, I guess, that, <laughs> I guess that's it. Like being kind, like, I know it seems a little bit, um, what's the word? I don't know, kind of too simple and maybe too sweet to be kind, but there is a certain kindness that I think um, supports people. A genuine kindness, not that niceness. Genuine kindness. Yeah, I love that. I love what you said about, you know, it's really about the relationship. Yeah. Uh, Completely, I agree. That's the name of the podcast, (laughs) Relationship There you go. Exactly. You know, even in a, you mentioned before, like the challenges of, as a yoga teacher to teach a big group class, like a drop-in class, I would still say, even in that context, there's still you're still in relationship with each of those people. And yeah. I think I think it shifts the feeling because sometimes I don't know, like it can be intimidating as a teacher, and it can take some work for me to like get myself in front of that group and to be confident and teach and be, you know. I think it's the next level of that to actually recognize that. I'm just being there in relationship to them. And that really everything I'm doing is about that relationship. Whether we just have like a moment of eye contact or a smile or, you know, even if I don't ever really ever get to talk to them, which is unfortunate, but that does happen. There might be students or like when I teach online, I teach big groups sometimes. I I can't even see them all the time. I just know they're there and that I'm trying to have a relationship with another human. Um, Yes. It just changes that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like lecturing from a podium. I don't know. I think you describe it perfectly. I can feel it as you're talking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, well, and that's how we make things accessible. I'll just go back to and just one thing about your question around ethics and accessibility is like you make it accessible when you touch someone on a human level, when you recognize their humanity, that shared, that your shared humanity. Yeah. you know that's how we make something accessible mm-hmm. well I'm aware that we just somehow f- time flew and we have a couple of minutes left um if you'd like to talk about all three of your books or other things I'd just love to share with people how they can find you and what they will find mm. yeah I mean mostly I I I train yoga teachers so a lot of my courses are for yoga teachers mostly. Um, And I do courses on all aspects of this. And and I host series with lots of other guest teachers. That's my other fun thing to do is I really love to platform other voices. And so you can check out Accessible Yoga School. We have um, courses on all kinds of things. We're gonna do one on like yoga for neurodiversity and Mm -hmm. making meditation accessible and chair yoga and uh, I run an accessible yoga training. That's the longest one that kind of covers all of the things. And then, yeah, I have three books. I mean, the first two books, first book is accessible yoga. It's really more just like of a guide with a lot of photographs and kind of just inspiring people to adapt the practice for themselves. And then I have a book called Yoga Revolution, which is more around yoga philosophy and looking at how we can integrate the yoga teachings into our lives and practice them, like actually practice them. Um, And then the last book I mentioned is the new one, The Teacher's Guide to Accessible Yoga, which is really specifically for yoga teachers and yoga therapists or people that anyone who uses yoga in their um, practice or in the way they share with the world. And it's just support for them. Like, I just wanted to help yoga teachers mostly. I think we all need help. So, yeah. Oh, I am so excited to read them. Are there any of them on audio? Yep. Uh, well, okay. the last one. So, the accessible the the teacher's guide to accessible yoga is an audio book uh, as well. Okay, great. Um, and that was fun. It was a fun journey to record it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, you know, my my mission is to help yoga teachers to um, do what they love and support them in that process. You know, and making their teaching. You know, I don't know, even wider bigger like connect to more people um you know because i think so there's a need there's a need out there for these teachings and i think yoga is just 
I, I, maybe I'll just say that, that I, I just feel grateful to have been exposed to the teachings and to get to share them and practice them and grateful to the custodians of the teachings, you know, from South Asia who kept the teachings alive for thousands and thousands of years. And so I just feel like I'm lucky to have that opportunity. And, yeah. Mm. Well, I feel very lucky to have gotten to sit with you for this time and to get to know you in this way. I'm looking forward to knowing you more and putting this out there in the world. Thank you for giving your time. Well, thanks for your great questions. Wow. They're You're awesome. Welcome. Thanks, Shelby. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.